question. Welcome to Poland again. Okay. You wrote the song Water. This world is not for me. I'll make a new one. Wait and see. Do you believe that lyrics can change the world? Um, I think that people can change the world. They can try and they can try again. And if it doesn't try, try again. <laughs> but um, there are <clears throat> there are a few men and women in the world whose lyrics, not particularly musicians, but writers, whether you like them or not, they, their words are still meaningful to a lot of people, like William Shakespeare, for instance. And, um, several other notable writers. By the way, I just would like to say that um, it feels strange for me to be on the side of a table and have you over there just uh, try and kind of dismiss with it. I, I much prefer to be over there with you. Mm. Um, so uh, don't let this uh, prevent you from um, Punching me in the mouth, if you want. <laughs> or bring the question to me. Anything else? Yes, please. Yeah, if I can ask a question. Uh, Eric, there are uh, several people here who remember your first visit to Poland, uh, including myself. It was 1965. And, uh, yeah, it was. <laughs> what, a, what a trivial question. Anything you remember from, from that first, uh, very first visit to Poland, or is it uh, too far away? <laughs> oh, it was uh, one of the most impressive uh, visits to any country that I've had any, anywhere, anytime. Because I was so young and because. Um, because um, I was being put into the depths of the political spectrum and uh, getting to to realize um, why Poland and Polish people meant so much to me. Um, one of the first people who showed me the power of jazz music and uh, blues music was a Polish uh, friend of mine in Newcastle. And he'd been uh, in the Polish division of the British Army in World War II. You know, I was impressed with, with Polish people, um, along with um, the uh, famous director, whose um, name escapes me at the moment. Um, Huh? Movie there? Yeah. Yeah. Like that? <laughs> yeah. Like that. Polanski. Yeah. The Polanski. Polanski oh, okay. and uh, the guy who did, who did the three, the trilogy, Man oh, of Iron. Yeah. Red, blue. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, yeah, I could dispense with, with all these Hollywood m movies on war years. Because by looking at the Polish movies, you could tell they were there. Mm -hmm. They knew what the experience really was. It wasn't Tony Curtis crawling up the white sands of uh, some island in Hawaii, you know, with a sprinkling of blood in his head, <laughs> coffered. Um, I remember one scene in particular. Um, it, I didn't do my research, so I'm scrambling here, but it's a, a young, uh, I think he was a reactionary, a reactionary against the communists, and uh, he was going through a back alley and there was these sheets hanging, the w women were drying their bed sheets, and he's running through the, the sheet, and uh, he grabs the sheet, he gets hit, and he's behind the sheet, and you see the blood come out of the sheet. Yeah, amazing, amazing stuff. You know. So I, 
I still watch those movies. I collect old movies if I can, wherever I can get them. Um, I love the world of uh, black and white cinema. It's um, much more stark and more realistic. So, uh, See, 1965, when you were here for the first time, there was deep communism in Poland, right? So, for us, it was it was a really big thing. There was a there was a famous uh, band from the uh, outside coming to play in Poland, and everybody just really freaked out. Oh my God! This is the animals coming here to Poland. And uh, um, if you were here, did, did you notice anything? Did anything touch you, like from the communist uh, thing? Did something, somebody told you, something happened? Do you remember? Because well, the communists, you know, 65, they were... We were working in the uh, Joseph Stalin Hall of Culture, I believe. Uh, it was the second, the first time that I worked in that particular venue. The next time I went back and it had been all reduxed and made very beautiful. But I remember talking to a, a Polish kid and I said, uh, the audience were incredible, they were wild, completely wild, jumping all over the place. There was no heat in the, in the facility. They were just relying on body heat. And, uh, and I said, the audience were real wild. And he said, yeah, it wasn't because of you, because they were wild. They were, demonstrating against Stalin. So I said, oh, okay. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> so, I don't know. But um, the, there, was, there was a little old lady by the roadside in the snow, and we were going along in this bus, and uh, it had automatic doors. The doors open, the doors shut. And uh, there was this, um, Low old lady standing by the roadside, and uh, she put her hand out, thinking that we were uh, the official bus. <laughs> and the doors went, <laughs> and we all looked at her, and she looked up at us, and she went, "Excuse me." <laughs> she stepped on the on the bus, and we we took off, and we just kept going, and we grabbed the whole one, and we were dancing with her. Looked like she was really enjoying it, so we just kept her on the bus. And we must have gone miles away from where she wanted to go, but she didn't complain. But um, maybe it's too late now to say I'm sorry, but if she had a long walk after that. <laughs> that came out. We didn't take that into consideration, you know, being uh, wild animals like we were. which weren't really worth that much to us. And I, we were just getting everybody stoned. You know, and see somebody, we'll buy them a, a big vodka or champagne, and we would tell the Secret Service or followers every, every step of the way. And, um, the airplane was when we were leaving. I was in the bar getting all these people hot and drunk and the plane was ready, it was taxiing already and they were going to leave me behind. So with the vodka and orange juice in my hand I walked out onto the runway and the plane came towards me and I just went, stop! <laughs> it was a whirlwind of snow and um, I climbed on board and I uh, got on my way home. but. If I hadn't have done that, I would have been left behind. And um, 
when your when your mates go home and it's not a, not a good feeling. So um, that was I'll never forget that. It was quite a memory. Um, as I'm sitting here talking, there's a lot of things come flashing back to me that, that I may have forgotten or come to me. So stand by for more. <laughs> Cheers. Henry, what, one of your most important bands was War. Yeah. What, what was the idea of uh, choosing uh, such a name? Was it uh, just an artistic war you had uh, you had in mind by that time? Uh, well, there was so much press and so much technical or film coming from the, the jungles of Nam and. We had friends who were on their way. They'd been given notification that they'd been uh, drafted. And we knew that they'd be dead the next day. There was no, no doubt about it. I mean, it was uh, 65,000 US troops who disappeared into a big hole in the jungle for nothing. And um, so that, uh, we just thought, if we call a band war, it'll either get people's attention or it won't mean anything. And um, it kind of worked on that level. Nobody took any notice, really. Maybe ex not in the US anyway. Maybe in the rest of the world and other places. But um, it, was a, it was a good experiment. It worked. We ended up um, doing Ronnie Scott's club, jazz club in uh, London and that was a big step because we were a rock band, you know, and uh, they were outsiders to start with being, being black. Um, and uh, yeah, we had some uh, uh, interesting little um, <laughs> Fascinating head to head with um, getting on board a plane. One day we were on our way to Copenhagen and from Rome, I think. And the pilot radioed ahead and said, um, We have a band of American revolutionaries on board. Because <laughs> there was a style of dressing back then, to, to again, to make the war in Vietnam seem small or insignificant. Um, one of the guys would wear uh, bandoliers of machine gun billets, billets, and they were all polished. And uh, it, it was a fashion statement, you know. Uh, but it, it worked uh, in reverse on the pilot in this airplane. And we landed in Copenhagen, and Lee Oscar, who was uh, from Copenhagen originally, he said, uh, don't worry, I'll handle I'll handle everything. I can talk to these people, and I'm going, okay, you know, go ahead. The more he talked to them, the worse it got. But I mean, they were waiting for us on the walkway when we got off the plane, and um, they kept everybody else still on the plane, and, and they said, okay, you can go, and we're at the top of the walkway, and uh, I looked down this tunnel, and I could see these guys in black uniforms and machine guns. And I got got up close to them, and I could see the. The bolts were open and the red tipped live ammunition. And they just said, sit down, you know. And we all sat with our hands and up behind our heads. And Lee started to talk to them, try to communicate with them. And it was, they, they were getting more and more upset. So uh, I got up with uh, one of the guys in the band and we, we went, uh, can we use the men's room? And they said, yeah, but be quick. Bought it. Uh, so we went in the bathroom and we swallowed and ate and smoked everything we had on us. <laughs> and uh, we came back and it was quite, quite funny by then. <laughs> as they hauled the Oscar away to prison because he could speak the language. <laughs> and yeah, a lot of stuff like that happened, you know. And um, we could, I can make light of it now, but. Um, you can't do that anymore. Uh, you can, but you suffer the consequences.
So I must say, life isn't a joke anymore. I mean, you know. And um, I don't want to get into politics, mm. but it's not America's not the same country that I went to to uh, escape the rain in England. Um, I went there not because of anything political. I went there because. <laughs> I'm an asthmatic, and I needed to be in uh, in the dry weather, in the sun. And that's the reason why I went there. And I took a lot of flack for that because everybody thought, "Oh, you're deserting the UK for the US." So, you know, but um, I think a lot of them were jealous. Actually, there was uh, I was always being portrayed in the press as a guy sitting by the swimming pool with a vodka and, uh, well, this is wine. <laughs> I had vodka last night <laughs> on the way here and it changed my attitude greatly towards the long journey up from the, I don't even know what direction we were coming in. We were, I thought we were going south. And the driver told me, no, you're going northeast. And I was like, well, again, it was a joke because northeast, I'm going to Newcastle. <laughs> We've just been there. <laughs> We're not going back again. Okay, but um, yeah, back to uh, Polish movies. Uh, one of uh, the best movies from uh, from. Uh, Kieślowski? Uh, who? Kieślowski. No, no, I mean... The, 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 huh? the one who lived in America. Polanski. Polanski. Polanski, right. His, one, of, one of his best movies, it was his first movie, was, was shot on my favorite island off the coast of Newcastle. It's called Holy Island and it's a causeway. And you have to get off the island by four o'clock, otherwise you have to spend the night there. And it was a great place to take girls, you know, because uh, you, know, like, you don't mention <laughs> until the water is coming in and say, oh man, I forgot to tell you, we got me off the island by four o'clock. <laughs> but uh, Roman was able to make it look like an exotic, hot environment. Uh, you, would, you know, is that skilled as a movie maker, and I could see why he chose Holy Island to make to to make cul-de-sac. It's perfect. Um, I just went back there um, a week ago with my camera crew because we were were making a documentary, and uh, and the weather was great. I'd never seen it so so brilliant. And the sun coming off the the everywhere was wet all around you from beneath your feet all the way out to uh, the North Sea. You know it was all brilliant. Usually it's dark and cold and uh, so I kind of relived what Roman Polanski had created in his in uh, Kolesa. That was pre pretty uh, impressive. And um, and the the gentleman that I mentioned to you who. Um, in my early days, he was the doorman on the New Orleans Jazz Club in Newcastle. And um, I would talk to him about his youth in, in uh, Poland. He, was, he really impressed me a lot. Um, so, so, there you go. May I ask you, uh, could you say a few words about today's show? Uh, today's show? Your gig that you're going to perform well, during yeah. the festival. Yeah. Can you describe it? Uh, what can we expect? Well, I have to do uh, animals, uh, hit records. Everybody expects that, <laughs> so that's what I do. You know, but when I can, I um, I push push all that stuff in there, and um, so I try and. Uh, I try and engineer a set that incorporates the animal songs, but also does a detour into uh, blues and uh, you know, stuff like that.
but uh, you recorded with them about the classic Luton Wickham whose numbers anyways. Yeah, well, boom, boom, etc. We were a, a blues band, you know. I mean, that's what it was, and and it was great as long as it was. But as soon as we got into the uh, <clears throat> into the realm of uh, big entertainment and record companies and and all of that, it, you know, the band just dissipated. It just just started to fall away bit by bit, and. Um, I had nothing else to do, so I stayed on, and uh, then eventually put war together. And uh, after war, I was really just washed up on on the shores of a strange island. And uh, for for some years, I just almost uh, became a parody of myself. Which is really bad. That's the worst thing anybody can do. Yeah, I want to be me. Mm. <laughs> you know, but um, it helps when uh, when you come across some something like this unique. Yeah, unique because you were a part of it. And that's what makes it unique in a way. So it's uh, it's very uh, soul comforting. To be able to do to do something like this, and um, I uh, thank you for coming and uh, reminding me of who I was and who I can be tonight. Three nights ago, I think it was, I was working with Jimmy Cliff, and um, and uh, I came off the sh off the stage, and Jimmy was coming in to do his show, and he said, "I heard your voice in the parking lot, really loud and clear, man. You got the, uh, you know, and, and that was like being blessed by the." Someone from a, a, on high, you know, and uh, I watched his show, and I realized that uh, how much uh, he he impressed me over the years. But we've been together, and like at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and things, and we didn't get a chance to talk. And it, and he said that to me. He said, "You know, I didn't get a chance to talk when we were sitting together in the, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame." He says, "So, you know." Yeah, keep keep rocking, bro. And that makes all the difference. From, you know. I have a question. Not maybe not enough. Uh, not about uh, about uh, who you were, but who you are now. Do you agree with the title of the latest uh, Buddy Guy album? The blues is still alive and well. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm asking because uh, you are a part. Uh, of uh, the big British blues explosion of the 60s, and you are like an encyclopedia for us. So, uh, is is blues in good hands at this moment? Uh, uh, do you do you trust in the in the young blues generation like uh, Joe Bonamassa and, and all that kind of people? Um, I trust in anybody that tries to express themselves through through that medium. You know. To me, um, blues and music um, from the very first time I heard it was religion. It was religion to me. Um, 
and um, so you, you can you can say, I, okay, I don't believe in God, <laughs> but you can say, I don't think there's no religion or any hope or anything, any levels higher than you are. If you th if you think that way, you're really in trouble. So to me, blues was is like really simple. Three chords, just like the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and God Himself. It's it's a makeup of what has been instilled in, in to me in terms of religion since I was a kid. But you know, it, when you go to a black church in Africa, America, you realize the power of religion, you know, and, and when white folks get together, it's just so, yeah, my But, you know, when, this hit me really hard when Jimi Hendrix died, you know, I was in the same room in the aftermath, and it was the first time in life that I wanted to, um, find a place to meditate and um, help myself get over that. And there was a church just along the street from where he was. And uh, I ran along to the, to the church, went straight to the front door, and it had big chains on it and a big padlock. I was like, what's that man about? So I, I, although I, I'm not Catholic, uh, uh, I can see the meaning in the, in the man, you know, and um, and have my own doubts about what I think, which is good. You know. May I ask you about your first visit to Poland, 1965? Yeah. But, but just only one thing. Do you have any special gift that you received from Polish soldier, probably? Because um, not really. We sh we shot some film. It Why was, not? It was uh, it was pictured on the album Animalism. When you have, oh, yeah. may I present you? Oh, with the Russian hat. Yes. Um, it was not Russian. It's not it's Russian. Polish. It was Polish. I said to somebody, it "Was Polish?" And they said, "No, it was Russian." It was. Oh, this guy. Can I give you? Yeah, this sure. One? <laughs> <laughs> this is a special gift, original from this year, oh. unique. This guy for remember. Thank you. May I? Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, you can put it on. Appreciate it. Put it on. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean on me. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Thanks a lot, Eric. My pleasure. It's for you. All the best. Thank you very for much. Good to remember. Thank you. Take care. Bless you. Fine. Now I have to wait for winter. <laughs> you can try it on. Clunk. <laughs> Peace. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thanks. I wait until winter. So this is Polish eagle. The single-headed eagle is Polish. Yes. Yes. Polish. Yes. That's why I got confused. They told me the double-headed eagle was was Russian. It was a Russian that gave me the heart originally. I was I was standing outside um, the store, well, in shopping. We were on the uh, sidewalk, and there was lots of people gathering around, wondering where we were. And, and a, a jeep came up, and a Russian soldier got out, and he said, "What are you doing here?" And I said, um, "I'm trying to I'm trying to find, buy a hat like yours." And he goes, are you, "Are you sure?" And I said, "Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. Said, Come with me." And I got in a jeep, in the back of the jeep, with two soldiers and AK-47s. 
and we went to a store that had specialized in in, in military dressing, right? And um, uh, ding, 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 I went in, and, and then he comes up, oh, yes, what can I do for you? He said, he wants a hat like this. Oh, she climbed up a ladder, she took it down, she came down, and was like, Dun, 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 dun. He put it on, you know. He said, you want anything else? I said, no, 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 that'll do. Thank you very much. <laughs> you put it away until you cross the border, until you get out of the country. Yeah, good memories. Thank you. One question. I appreciate it. You must have. 20 years ago, we met after the gig in Congress Hall in Warsaw. I told you I feel 33 years younger than like in 1965. Please, Master, do today this magic and make us a little bit younger because I have heard your musicians. You have a very good band. How did you find these fantastic musicians? How did I find... Musicians. You mean the current guys? Yes, the current yeah, guys. Yeah, these young people. You, you, today, um, you observe these people and you're in sound check. Someone who's very close to me and close to you at this moment found them on online. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You was looking for a band and she said, check these guys out. And they came on, on uh, Facebook. And I looked at them and I saw the piano player and his fingers moving. I said, these guys are good. Hmm. Let's get them together, yeah. So it, it can be done any way, anyhow, you know. You just got to keep searching. But, he, but when, you, when you get somebody in place, it's not over. You have to live with these people. You got to get along with them, you know. And uh, it's worked for me with, with this band. I get, get a lot of, I get a lot of compliments saying that uh, these guys are really good and um, yeah. So yeah. So if you um, if you're watching the show tonight, keep that in in mind that uh, we came together via social media. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. <Ooh. laughs> I do remember you, Thank you very on the stage in Warsaw in 1998. You sang the House of the Rising Sun on your, on your knees. So is uh, that sound important for you also nowadays? Um, every, every time I sing it, I'm like, I'm off on a journey, you know. Um, it has to be real, 